Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this webinar launch of the OECD study Monitoring Corporate Disclosure. My name is Luca Maiotti, and uh, with my colleague Benjamin Katz, we work in the minerals team of the OECD Center for Responsible Business Conduct. The study, now linked in the chat, is the culmination of two years of work we carried out with Wikirate and is part of a broader effort by the OECD to build an evidence base for policymakers and stakeholders on responsible business conduct. This is also why we try to focus on implementation trends and patterns in the report to inform future decision making and support not only wider uptake of due diligence, but more effective due diligence. The study we are presenting today uses a benchmarking approach to assess company reporting against the OECD due diligence guidance for responsible supply chains of minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas. We will begin with a brief presentation of the study's findings, followed by reaction from stakeholders from government, industry and civil society. The OECD minerals guidance is the leading government backed standard for companies along the whole mineral supply chain from miners to manufacturers and end users to address risks of serious human rights abuses, conflict financing, and other financial crimes linked to the sourcing of minerals. The study tracked the completeness of corporate reporting on these risks of adverse impacts, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide. The guidance uses a five-step framework to guide companies' due diligence, spanning management systems, risk identification, risk management, auditing, and annual reporting. The study's methodology reflects this approach using step five on reporting to assess how companies are doing on the other four steps through their disclosure. You can see the indicators we used on the right hand side of the slide. Public disclosures are, of course, only a proxy for companies' implementation of the minerals guidance. Companies might do more than they disclose or conversely exaggerate their performance in public, faces, public facing documents which is why other research is needed to complement benchmarking approaches. The study looked at the disclosure of 503 companies producing or sourcing minerals or metals, comprising over 300 downstream companies, nearly 150 smelters, refiners, and commodity traders, and more than 50 major and junior mining companies. Most downstream companies were selected based on revenue with the number of companies per country selected based on GDP. Companies from countries with small GDPs, but which play key role in mineral supply chains and 50 states owned and privately held companies were added based on desk research. We took this approach to reflect global markets and include companies with the leverage to influence practices throughout their supply chains. The sample included companies that produce or source tin, tungsten, tantalum, gold, cobalt, copper, aluminium, lead, zinc, iron, steel, and precious stones. The study looks at 2014 and 2018 datasets, a period that saw due diligence requirements become mainstreamed and due diligence programs become fully operational. We aim to continue collecting this data at roughly the same interval to track how uptake continues to evolve. Now, getting to the results of the study. Overall, we saw the share of companies with some uptake with, of the guidance grow to more than half by 2018. Companies are doing much better on due diligence policies, though, than reporting with any specificity on how they implement due diligence, which is a major source for concern. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the study found strong links between legislation and participation in industry due diligence programs with increased uptake. But companies that fall outside legislation, especially in end user sectors that have been under less scrutiny for minerals due diligence, showed very low uptake, dragging down averages across the board. Let's look at these findings in detail. Perhaps the headline finding is that a majority of companies in the sample demonstrated some uptake of the guidance in 2018, with a notable improvement since 2014. We also see uptake well beyond the supply chains traditionally under the most scrutiny, like tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold. Still, 
almost half of sample companies have no disclosure at all, which of course dilutes the influence of companies that do carry out due diligence. On this slide, we can see how companies performed on each step of the UACD minerals guidance. The variation here says a lot about where companies need to improve. Average scores on due diligence policies are quite good, but drop off for other steps. Companies low scores on step two, identifying risks, and step three, responding to risks, is certainly cause for concern. It may suggest significant shortcomings in implementation, but could also be due to the reluctance to disclose actual risks in detail, including for fear of litigation or reputational harm. These steps, though, are the main vectors for due diligence to positively impact mining communities. In general, disclosures are simply not specific enough, and it's important to underline here that the guidance expects companies not only to disclose how they conduct due diligence, but what their due diligence has revealed and the specific steps they have taken to address risks. This graph breaks out performance by supply chain segment, including downstream companies, smelters and refiners, or SORs, and other companies further upstream, like miners and traders. Step four of the minerals guidance calls on downstream companies to audit the due diligence practices of the SORs in their supply chains. In this graph, we look at SORs for tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold or 3TG, separately from other SORs since these sectors have been under more scrutiny and subject to due, to due diligence legislation much longer than other minerals and metals. And indeed, the data appear to bear the scrutiny out. We can see how the SORs in tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold far outperformed others, albeit with lots of room for improvement. I'll now pass the floor to Ben for the second part of the presentation. Thanks, Luca. We can move to the next slide. On this slide, we further disaggregated performance, not only by supply chain segment, but also by metal. And there are some intriguing patterns here. In seven of the eight metals with a significant number of companies, the downstream segment scored highest on the five-step framework. And maybe unsurprisingly, given the historical attention the Great Lakes region of Africa has received, companies sourcing the metals most heavily concentrated in the region, tantalum and cobalt, scored highest. Downstream investments in due diligence, though, aren't necessarily cascading up the chain, especially for 3TG, at least based on this global snapshot of disclosures. What's actually going on here isn't entirely clear, but it raises a number of questions about the mechanics of due diligence infrastructure. While it's more anecdotal due to the, due to the small number of companies in the sample, upstream companies from the Democratic Republic of the Congo actually scored much better than the upstream average as well as their downstream counterparts. So the low overall performance of upstream companies globally seems to suggest general weaknesses in how downstream companies engage with upstream counterparts rather than any failings specific to the regions most under the microscope. We can move to the next slide. Drilling down further into downstream performance also reveals huge variation between sectors. While the semiconductor, electronics, pharma, and auto sectors did relatively well on the five-step framework indicators, most of the other sectors scored less than 10%. These sectors tend to be end users of metals, but do not manufacture or license original equipment themselves. They're also rarely the object of advocacy and to date are generally not covered by due diligence legislation. This might explain the low performance, but it's still an important gap and the OECD guidance still expects such companies to carry out due diligence. This also partly explains the paradox of the downstream scoring poorly overall but higher than the rest of the supply chain for specific metals. Too many downstream companies that are known to source minerals or metals in some form do not report at all, which drag down the segment's average performance. But those that do report, including the metal they source, performed relatively well. We can move to the next slide. When it comes to drivers of due diligence, the study certainly suggests legal requirements play an important role. As you can see here, Companies covered by Section 1502 of the Dodd-Frank Act performed relatively well, scoring 50% on average against the five-step framework indicators. The levels of disclosure by companies referencing the UK Modern Slavery Act of 2015 and the French Duty of Vigilance Law of 2017 also scored higher than average against the five-step framework. This is particularly notable considering such laws do not have a mineral-specific focus, and 2018 was the first reporting year for the French law. So this data provides more of a baseline. Still, disclosures referencing all three laws remain fairly incomplete. 
and the very low scores on the Annex 2 risk indicators suggest many companies are stuck either in a kind of tunnel vision focused only on certain risks or a compliance approach reticent to go beyond legally required reporting obligations. Given the time frame of the data, the EU responsible mineral sourcing regulation isn't captured in the study, but of course will be in the future. We can move to the next slide. Another driver of due diligence are joint industry due diligence programs, which often carry out audits at control points in the supply chain. Downstream responsible minerals initiative members perform far better than non-members on the five-step framework in the sample. And yet RMI members still show similarly low levels of disclosure against the full Annex 2 risk scope. Also, in some sense, the impressive results of downstream RMI members compared to non-members is likely the result of the self-selected nature of RMI membership, which puts into stark relief the dichotomy between higher and lower scrutiny companies and their divergent approaches to due diligence. We can move to the next slide. We decided to take a sectoral deep dive on electric vehicles, given the industry's relevance to green transition and its dependence on metals. Not only do companies in EV supply chains perform better on the five-step framework than the average company in the study sample, they also made significantly more improvement between 2014 and 2018. Nonetheless, and consistent with the pattern we see in other sectors, the EV supply chain scored poorly on steps two and three, identifying and responding to risks. This is a major shortcoming considering how critical comprehensive risk mitigation will be for realizing a just transition that benefits mining communities. Another sector we looked at, the construction industry, is much more of a laggard. While a large user of metals and a mainstay of the global economy, it had average scores in both years in the single digits. So where does this leave us? The study provides compelling evidence of some of last decade's achievements, that minerals due diligence has become a normative expectation and that emerging due diligence infrastructure in the form of market and legal, legal requirements and industry programs supported steady growth and uptake of the guidance. But the evidence also suggests we need not only to build on this foundation, but we also need to better utilize it to ensure due diligence is effective and makes a positive impact on mineral producing countries. There's still much more that policymakers can do to promote better public reporting on minerals due diligence through regulatory frameworks, public reporting <clears throat> repositories, or by incorporating due diligence disclosure requirements into public procurement guidelines. Industry initiatives need to do better at helping cascade due diligence up the supply chain so that audits aren't reduced to a pass fail measure, but inform downstream engagement with suppliers and enhance the use of leverage to bring about improved practices. Programs also need to expand beyond their traditional geographic focuses and hold members accountable for the reporting. The ultimate responsibility for improved due diligence, of course, rests on companies, which need to bring renewed focus to steps two and three identifying and responding to supply chain risks. Civil society will also be critical to maintaining pressure on companies, providing vital information on conditions along the supply chain and empowering rights holders throughout. To achieve better results, measurable results, we're convinced we need to work together, which is why we're also seeking to collaborate more on monitoring, whether through implementing OECD methodologies like the m and &E framework for the guidance or embedding these indicators into other due diligence projects. <clears throat> 